Well, last week, uh, we heard Jesus call five witnesses, and you got a two for last week, two sermons in one, because I thought I put all five of them in one sermon, so <laughs> I looked at the time, it was 40 minutes. <laughs> so Hopefully, we can end it earlier than that this time. Well, Jesus ended by telling the Pharisees, the religious leaders, that they didn't even follow Moses. And as you know, the chapter headings in our Bible are only there for convenience of finding things. And so we go right into the, this uh, story of a miracle that John tells us right after Jesus talks about Moses. And what he's trying to tell us is that Jesus is, is in the place of Moses and feeding all these people like Moses did in the wilderness. So that's why this is coming right after that. Now let's go ahead and read the scripture. And then I'm going to uh, imagine what might have happened with these characters and with this scene and all these things. So John 6, 1 to 15. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing on the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where would we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, now well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among for so many? Then Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told the disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten them. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This really is the prophet who was to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. That's God's word. Now let's go into the realm of imagination and look at it a little bit. First of all, let's look at the characters. We have Jesus. We have the crowd. We have the disciples and Philip, Andrew, and this boy who is named. Now, previous to this in the other gospels, we found that Jesus has sent the disciples off on a mission around the towns to heal the sick and cast out demons and to preach the good news. And now they've just all come back, the disciples, and they're all excited about what they've done. They'd seen even demons go out in their name and in another gospel Jesus says, don't rejoice, the demons obey you, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So he had to teach them and so he knew that they needed to get off by themselves with him and have a little retreat after this. And so there was also another thing going on at this time. Herod had executed John the Baptist, and Jesus had just heard about it. And he knew there was serious danger here, because now Herod had also heard about Jesus and the disciples doing all this over in Galilee. And that's where they were located, is Galilee, which was Herod's jurisdiction. So Jesus took them across, around the north side of the um, Sea of Galilee, over to Bethsaida Julius. There's two Bethsaidas. This is the one where Philip is from, actually. This is from Google Earth, and it's you can see here's the Lake of Galilee, and they're coming around here. This is the Jordan River. They had to ford that, all 5,000 of these men. I think they probably accumulated people as they came around. It's nine miles around here. So, And then they, you can see this kind of grassy plain area here. This is where Bethsaida is. And then you can see these mountains desert mountains, and you can see this grassy plain down here. We don't exactly know which of these he was, uh, was at there, but you can see if you went up here that there would be places here where the people could gather, same as up here. 
Just another view of that. Isn't that pretty? That's the Lake of Galilee from the Golan Heights. That's what we call that mountainous area on the other side of Galilee. It was springtime, so there was green on the hills. It was Passover time, so everybody was thinking about Moses. And as he said in chapter 5, Jesus compared, uh, told the religious leaders that they didn't follow Moses, and John the Baptist has us now thinking of Jesus as Moses. So they were sitting on the hill, Jesus and the disciples, and he sees 5,000 people coming around the bend, kind of surging through there. Now, I'm not sure how many women and children they were. There probably were some because they were, it was because of the sick that, that he was hitting the sick that they were coming. But it's nine miles. I'm not so sure that, that sick people and kids could go nine miles. I don't know. But it was mostly men, apparently. And it was 5,000 of them, and I think Jesus saw them coming around there, and it looked like an army coming around there. And of course, Herod's not going not gonna to be excited about an army of 5,000 people, so Jesus is getting a little bit apprehensive here. And Jesus now, and his work with the disciples, this is a big old buzz in Galilee now. Everybody's all excited about this. You can imagine. If that was going on around here, what it would be like. And then it says in another gospel that Jesus had compassion on these people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were, they were vulnerable to charlatans, false teachers. That would, uh, just like wandering sheep, would guide them someplace they shouldn't go. So he decided to change his plans, rearrange his schedule, and he was going to use this as a teaching moment for his disciples. And so all day they healed and they taught the people. And at the end of the day, there was nothing left to eat. I don't know if they ate it all or if they all had just left. And the spirit of the moment without anything seems kind of odd, but it could well be that's what they did. But anyway, they don't have anything to eat. So Jesus asked Philip. Now, Philip. He had been performing miracles already. He'd been healing people. He's one of the disciples. He'd been casting out demons. He'd been doing all these things in the name of Jesus. So he knew what the authority of Jesus could do. He knew the resources of his home area. This is where he's from. So it only made sense that Jesus would ask him, what are we going to do to feed these people? Of course, Jesus knew what he was going to do, John tells us. Philip knew there wasn't enough money. He knew there wasn't even enough food in the, in the city of or the little, little town of Bethsaida, which isn't there anymore. It's just a green place right now. So he says, feed all these people? What does Jesus expect me to do? Take an offering? Go buy food in town? There isn't enough food anywhere near to feed all these people. Besides, no one has enough money even for a mouthful for so many. What was Philip? Philip was an impossibility thinker. He knew the power of God, and yet, well, this was just impossible. We think like that quite a bit, I think, sometimes. Somebody thinks God wants to do something, they go, oh, yeah, right, that's not going to happen. Like this church. Is this church going to grow? And I've heard more than one time, well, that's probably not going to happen. But that's an impossibility thinker. Do you know anybody else like that? People who think that belief is pretending, that it's all fake jargon, that it's all silly questions. An impossibility thinker forgets what God has done in the past. Our memories are so short, you know. God can do incredible things in our lives, and in a couple of months, we don't remember it anymore. Or if we do, it seems kind of like a fantasy to us. It's such a strange thing our brains do. It's because we try to find rational reasons for things and, and we just kind of forget. And, and so then the next time God wants us to do something, we can't believe he can do it, just like Philip. Isn't that odd? It keeps, from, it keeps us from accepting a vision that God might have for us, this impossibility thinker, thinking. Well, then that's Philip says, most of a year's salary worth of bread wouldn't be enough for them to even get a mouthful, he says. And you know what? Philip's statistics were accurate. But he had a serious accounting error. He uh, didn't factor in the power of God. Now, Andrew. Andrew. 
He thought that feeding all these people was also unlikely. But Andrew was a possibility thinker. Andrew tried something. He went to search for options among the crowd. Now, in reading commentaries, I noticed that some of them, they, they really don't like miracles very much. They want to take all the miracles out of the Bible to find out what really happened. <laughs> and so they try to find, or, or they, they try to find natural causes for the miracles, like that crossing of the Red Sea in the Old Testament was probably over a marshy area. You've heard this kind of stuff. Let's just take the story as it is and believe the miracle. Why not? What they say in this one is that the boy sharing his lunch shamed everyone else into opening their lunch and sharing with each other. So everyone had enough. <laughs> the little glitch in that theory is that Andrew had already discovered that nobody had any food. The only food was his little boy with his little lunch. There wasn't any natural causes for this miracle. So Andrew, he talked this boy into giving, his, uh, giving up his lunch, giving it to Jesus. Andrew did what he could. He's a possibility thinker, but he left the rest of it to Jesus because he knew what Jesus could do. He was a possibility thinker. How about us? Is there a, a miracle possible among us here? We pray for healing. Sometimes we see that. Sometimes we don't. We often pray for safe travel, and as far as I can tell, has been well answered. And every Sunday, we talk about where we've seen God amongst us, and been doing this for, what, five years now, or maybe a little less. And, and I think that we are more aware of looking for God's presence in our world. Do we believe that God can grow our church? Are we possibility thinkers? Do we believe that Jesus can reach people with the good news in this town, in this community that don't know him? Because I'm sure there must be some. Even if we don't think it'll do any good if we start going out with the options and start talking to people and leave the rest to God, that's all he asks. Now that boy. That little boy. We don't know anything about it. We, uh, what do you think? What do you think happened? Did, did Andrew sneak up on him and steal his lunch? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Did Andrew wrestle him to the ground and grab it? Or did Andrew just make him feel so guilty that he had to give it up? You know, you're the only one with food, and all these people are starving. I mean, did that, is that what Andrew did? I don't think so. Here's what I imagine happened. Now let's call this little guy Nathan, just for fun. So one day he was out taking care of the goats when he saw this huge crowd of people hurrying around the shoreline. <laughs> Not this one, the one in Galilee. He ran into the house. Mom, what's going on? There's all these people walking through town. Oh, they're just pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem. It's Passover, remember? Oh, there's too many for that, Mom. I'm going to go follow them, see what they're doing. Well, Nathan, it's nearly time for lunch. Oh, he said, disappointed. I tell you what, his mom said. I'll just put some pita and some dried <coughs> fish in a basket, and you can take it with you. It'll be a picnic. Oh, great, Mom. So he hurried off, melted into the crowd that swelled with more people from the town. Maybe they knew Philip, and maybe they knew Jesus was there too. It was an excited crowd. They're all going to see something today. Yes, sir. That's for sure. And Nathan was swept up in the thrill of the day, and he forgot all about his lunch as he watched people heal the devils being thrown out while the victims screeched and writhed. He listened to Jesus teach while this went on all day. And then he began to get hungry. I remembered his lunch. 
and he was just starting at it when one of the disciples walked up to him and saw him. Hi, what's your name? The disciple asked. Nathan, sir. Oh, I see you have some food there. Would you like to give it to Jesus? Why? Doesn't he have food of his own? No. No one has any food. And they're all hungry. Jesus wants to feed them. And he wants to use your lunch. Would you like to see what he might do with your lunch? Oh, would I? <laughs> Here, take it. And then Nathan followed Andrew up to where Jesus was leaning against a rock. And Andrew gave the little basket to Jesus and said, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus smiled down at Nathan and invited him to sit up on the rock. And Nathan smiled back and climbed up. He was happy and excited to see what Jesus would do. He knew Jesus was going to perform a wonderful miracle with his lunch like he'd been doing all day. He didn't need to suspend disbelief because he knew what Jesus could do. He knew Jesus. He couldn't wait to see what would happen with this little lunch. Nathan wasn't an impossibility thinker. Nathan wasn't a possibility thinker either. Nathan was a all things are possible thinker. Nathan knew Jesus would use his little lunch. It didn't matter how small it was. It was what Jesus needed, so he gave it to him because he needed it. Then Jesus instructed the disciples to have everyone sit down in manageable groups. Nathan sat by Jesus and watched what he would do. When everyone was seated, Jesus took a pita and broke it into pieces. And when all the bread was used up and only one piece was in his hand, he kept breaking it into pieces and more pieces and more pieces, and more pieces, and more pieces. He did the same with the fish, mounds, large baskets of food. It was the Passover story of Moses demonstrated before their very eyes. Jesus, like Moses, was feeding the people in the wilderness. Like Elisha, feeding an army of a 100 men. But here it was happening before his eyes. Nathan just sat there awed by what he saw Jesus doing. You know, it doesn't matter how large or how small your gift is. When you give it to Jesus, something happens beyond your imagination. Jesus transforms the insignificant into wonder. Do you believe that? You believe he can, but do you believe he will? What do you have to give to Jesus? Is it so small? In our hearts, we might think, oh, I'm, I'm too old to do any of this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm too sick. I can, I can barely walk upstairs. What are you talking about? Jesus can't use me. <laughs> when I get up first thing in the morning, that's pretty much how I feel. I'm too old. I'm too stiff to do much anything. What can God use me for? Well, if that's true for you, then you're like Philip. You're right. Maybe we are too old, maybe we are too stiff and sick and whatever. Maybe we don't have the very best talents out there. Maybe we really can't tell people about Jesus because we're just not that brave to start talking about religion. That's right. Well, that's accurate accounting. That's right. But we've uh, neglected to factor in the power of God. Nothing is impossible when God's in the project. Like Andrew, you can be a possibility thinker. You're maybe not certain what God can do. 
you, you know it's possible. God can do something beyond what I imagine. You know it's possible. And, and maybe you do have some little resources you can, you can use. Maybe you are talented at something that you can do. Uh, even if it doesn't seem good enough somehow. Maybe you don't feel like you're at the top of your game somehow. Oh, what needs to be done is so huge and complicated and looks like it's just impossible. And you don't even know where to begin. But you're willing to give it a try. You're a possibility thinker. It's possible with God in the picture. Or maybe, maybe we're like Nathan. You know what? Jesus didn't need Nathan's lunch. When he was being tempted by the devil, what did the devil say? Turn these rocks into bread? And if Jesus couldn't do that, it wouldn't have been much of a temptation, right? If Jesus said, what? Turn rocks into bread? That can't be done, you stupid devil. No, apparently Jesus can turn rocks into bread. He didn't need Nathan's lunch. But he decided to use this little gift of this young boy and just blow him away. So Jesus did. What a privilege to set our small gifts in Jesus' hand and see what he can do. Even if we say, what is that amongst so many? That doesn't really matter, because Jesus would like to blow us away. All we have to do is try it and find out. You know, I am so encouraged by you folks, some of you folks. I, some of you are, have worked with this town to create a business community now. We're, we're working on this. And why do I bring this up in church? Well, it's because, I don't know who said it, uh, the rising tide lifts all boats. As this, as this town grows, as you bring in businesses or whatever it is you can bring in that creates jobs and brings people into this town, that will also bring people to Christ because they're going to start coming under the influence of all the believers here, including us. And I believe that this church can grow as we bring people to Christ, people who move here for the businesses you're going to create. God is doing something in this town. And sure, you can't do much, maybe. You can do the little. You can meet every Thursday like you've been doing. Some of you, doing what you can. And watch God blow you away. That's the kind of thing he does. Just give your efforts to Jesus and watch what he does.